So that's so is that one similar to exfoliating? Yep. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. So it, the microdermabrasions do several things. They exfoliate. They also stimulate collagen and elastin. So deep down, they're working at stimulating the fibroblasts, which are a specialized cell that make collagen and elastin. So a lot of what we're talking about with making your skin healthy is to remove problems and to increase our collagen and elastin, which are two special fibers that are broken down with aging and mm -hmm. with other um, things. A lot of free radicals destroy them. We have enzymes in our own bodies that destroy them. And the, when we're younger, they're destroyed at the same rate that they're made. But oh. as we get older with these extrinsic factors and intrinsic aging, we're destroying them faster than they're made. Oh, <laughs> so yes. we want to so. rev those up. Mm -hmm. So microdermabrasions, chemical peels, we have some really wonderful IPL lasers. Our skin rejuvenation laser helps with that quite a bit and oh. does some other things as well. Okay. So. Wow, it sounds really great. And um, you know, when we're talking about this, all of these treatments, is it something that you would recommend to everyone that maybe want to uh, make themselves a little bit, or what is the game plan there? Well, it depends, and there's mm -hmm. different ways of trying to assess what a person needs. Uh, but I think it's certainly uh, everyone can use, you know, some protection mm -hmm. uh, to minimize further damage. And in addition to the treatments that Dr. Ruth was discussing, there's also some medications that can be applied. N not only medications that specifically find bad cells similar to the photodynamic therapy that was discussed, but also medications, the class is generally called retinoids. And these retinoids are topical vitamin A that stimulates new collagen elastic tissue so that in between more procedural sorts of processes, you can uh, apply that at home and that helps stimulate in collagen to a lesser, less dramatic degree, but it may help maintain uh, some improvement that you otherwise may not get to the same level if you didn't do that. I agree. I think everyone can work to make their skin healthier. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the cosmetic procedures that we have available, not everybody actually can benefit from those. So I really don't believe everybody should have them. Mm -hmm. There are some medical conditions that many of them are contraindicated for. Um, there are some people who shouldn't have treatments that involve lasers or lights, some people who shouldn't have treatments that inju involve injections if they have blood clotting problems and things. Mm -hmm. um, so there, not everybody is a candidate for that. So I, th I think it's really important um, when somebody is looking to choose a clinic to get cosmetic treatments f um, to look and see, are they paying attention to the whole person? Sure. Are they looking at not only are you coming in and able to pay for the treatments, mm -hmm. but most importantly, what's your medical history? How would you benefit? What is your lifestyle? What's your uh, manner of taking care of your skin? Are there any contraindications for any of these things? Some people have allergies where they shouldn't have certain things. Um, now, having said that, there's some medical conditions. There are also some um, some procedures that people want that actually aren't available yet. Uh -huh. So oh, we okay. we are very clear when people would not benefit or we would actually be causing them harm that we explain that to people. Uh -huh. If somebody wants something that isn't you know available yet, mm -hmm. um, they might have unrealistic expectations, or maybe you've just read about some research that isn't really available, but somebody's starting oh. those things. And so mm -hmm. again, we don't want to mislead people. We always tell people what is available, what's realistic, what would help them and what wouldn't help them. Right. So, Wow, that's great. And you're talking about a lot of needles and people that, you know, may bleed extra and things like that. And it's great that you take that into consideration, look oh, yeah. at each individual, mm -hmm. you know, type of thing. And um, another that brings me to a question, of course, when you talk about Botox, mm -hmm. you know, then of course, you know the needles going in, are, I've seen pictures of the Botox. So what is the difference between the Botox and then the dermal fillers? Well, Botox is actually a neuromodulator. It's a class of medicine, and there's another one out now in the, that's FDA approved in the United States called Dysport. So okay. they're both neuromodulators. They were derived actually from a poison. Oh. Like many of our things in medicine, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, when you take penicillin, you're actually not eating the mold that penicillin was derived from. Um, there's a medicine that's used for the heart called digitalis. It actually came from a foxglove flower. Okay. So, I mean, and there's um, medicines used in anesthesia that came from like the curare poison that the Indians used to, I think South American Indians dip their arrow spears in. Medicine is really creative in that it takes things that are available and looks in how we can uh, benefit from those. Anyway, botulinum toxin was actually noted to have some 
uh, neuromuscular effects where it actually slowed down and stopped the contractions of certain muscles. Okay. And Botox is actually a purified form of that. It's not the poison. Mm -hmm. It's actually a purified protein derived from the poison. Mm -hmm. It was first used in children with uh, blepharospasm. Uh, ophthalmologists noticed that people who had spasming of the eyes, they could inject some Botox into certain muscles in there, and then instead of always being cross-eyed, those children could see. And then it started to be used for people with neck spasms, and mm -hmm. then a dermatologist uh, Dr. Carruthers noted that it would be really helpful in preventing the repetitive creasing from repetitive mo um, movements oh. that forming the wrinkles. Mm -hmm. And so um, they started advocating using it for cosmetic reasons, and it's, it's, it's really a, a great treatment for that. When I think about things that make your skin healthier, this is not one that's mm -hmm. stimulating collagen and elastin. Mm -hmm. One could think about it, it is stopping the repetitive trauma from the repetitive creasing of the muscle contraction, okay. but that's pretty much it. Um, and a, a really uh, refined clinic is going to just selectively soften muscle contraction rather than make you look like a zombie with no expression on the face. Yeah, <laughs> so really. You don't want that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Um, so the difference between that is that is actually working on where the nerve and the muscle interact. It's kind of slowing down and softening the muscle contraction okay. where the Botox was injected. Dermal fillers work differently because it's a completely different process. As we get older, we lose volume in our face. Mm -hmm. We lose um, volume in our cheeks. We lose volume in our nasolabial folds around here. Some people get a big divot here from if they have a strong labellar crease. Sure. And Dermal fillers are made from the same substances that are in the ground substance in our face. Mm -hmm. um, simple sugars like hyaluronic acid, some of them also have calcium uh, based microspheres in them as, as well. And these are treatments that we inject into the skin to replace the last volume. They also happen to stimulate collagen and elastin. Oh. Yeah, I know you're okay. picking up on my theme here. But yeah, I am. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the, yeah. the really, it's, they're wonderful in replacing the last volume that we've had. Mm -hmm. Because if you combine losing collagen and elastin and then loss of volume, the skin kind of sags mm -hmm. and shows the wrinkles more. Yeah. So if we can replace the volume in the areas that have become volume depleted, we're restoring a more natural look. Right. As they say, as we get older, the gravity is taking a taking its toll, mm -hmm. and so it just sounds like, you know, you're kind of just giving it a little jump up again. Yeah. yeah. So mm -hmm. we can do it. Oh, go ahead. Another uh, aspect that's a little different is typically the Botox is used up in the upper part of the face, and then the dermal fillers typically used more uh, lower for those reasons, that this is stopping the, uh, slowing the contractions, and then this is filling in the volume. Okay. That's a, a general rule, yeah. Um, in our clinic, we're pretty advanced with this, and we do use Botox adjunctively in lower parts mm -hmm. of the face. Okay. Uh, we can do some, some facial shaping oh. with different uh, uh, techniques that way. Okay. That brings me to my next question, then. As we get older, we all have a tendency to have a little bit of sagging skin, and we all like to take care of that. So what remedies do you have for that? That's a, a really good question. There's multiple levels in there, because it would depend on the degree of the sagging. Okay. Um, some of the sagging could be tightened up a little bit. We have a, a, a laser treatment called our Emax skin tightening treatment and um, that's actually really nice and effective. We have an accent or radio frequency treatment that we can use for skin tightening as well. Okay. Well there's a quite a range of remedies for sagging skin. It depends on the amount of sagging skin. It can vary from minimally uh, loose in some areas to quite significant where people have significant jowls and significant amount of, of skin underneath the, the chin as well. Mm -hmm. And so it depends and also on um, how much improvement a person wants. And the more dramatic a response, there's more risk. Uh, and generally more cost involved as well. So there's quite and, a few different... And more recovery time, too. More recovery time, yeah. exactly. And so there's quite a different, a, a few number of parameters to, to discuss with a person. And so then you try to individualize your treatment plan with the person's expectations, desires, and what they have to improve.